In our quest to understand sustainable development and right now economic development, we've focused on the modern era of economic growth. We saw how the Industrial Revolution began in England and spread to all the world. Or one should say almost all the world because there are some places that still, even to this day, lack some of the basics uh, and lack some of the ongoing economic growth that uh, indeed has reached almost all of the planet. We've been undertaking a differential diagnosis to understand how those uh, moving ripples of economic development have reached some places in the world and failed to reach others. We've explored the role of the poverty trap. We've explored the role of geography, the role of culture, the role uh, of politics. Let's put the pieces together by focusing on those remaining areas in the world that are still stuck uh, below the threshold of self-sustaining growth. And as we've used the idea of passing that threshold, looking at the $2,000 uh, per person per year threshold as a marker for us, when we look at the map of global development, we see that those countries shown in red on this map are the ones that, as of today, are still below that takeoff level. What do we see? We see that the remaining regions are mainly tropical Africa, and then a number of landlocked countries, Afghanistan, Nepal, uh, Mongolia, uh, Laos, and a few other parts of the world. And of course, uh, without question, we have to regard Sub-Saharan Africa as the greatest challenge of development, the place in the world still with the highest poverty rates and with uh, the biggest challenges uh, in meeting basic needs. The good news is that in recent years, especially since the year 2000, economic growth in Sub-Saharan Africa has picked up. There's definitely progress, major advances in some of the key areas uh, of disease control, improved access to education, building infrastructure, uh, but we're still not yet uh, in a situation where there is self-sustaining, rapid and dynamic growth, though one feels very much that it's within reach. Let's put our differential diagnosis perspective, therefore, on Sub-Saharan Africa and ask what we learn by taking that uh, multi-dimensional view of a region uh, to see what it implies for the priorities for economic and sustainable development. Africa has many distinct structural characteristics and many of these structural characteristics are indeed structural problems for economic development. If you look at the uh, region of poverty in Africa, uh, that is below the Sahara Desert, but above the southernmost countries, uh, one is defining essentially the region of the tropics of Africa, between the Tropic of Cancer at 23 degrees north latitude and the Tropic of Capricorn at 23 degrees south latitude. And we know that the African tropics have many distinctive features that are relevant for economic development. Disease burden we've seen is very heavily concentrated in the tropics, whether it's malaria or other so-called vector-borne diseases or worm infections that debilitate uh, people and that hold back whole societies. We've seen that agriculture can be very difficult in tropical conditions, uh, often water scarcity with the very high temperatures, drought propensity, soil nutrient depletion uh, can be extremely pernicious in the tropical context. So this is one feature that needs to be addressed. Nothing impossible uh, about these challenges because diseases like malaria are fully controllable but they need to be controlled. We've seen that Africa has a distinctive feature uh, 
of the most landlocked countries of any continent in the world. Roughly one in three African countries is landlocked. 15 out of the 49 countries of sub-Saharan Africa. That's a big problem. Why is that? Well, part of the reason is the colonial legacy. Remember that nature doesn't draw national boundaries. Politicians do. And when the politicians uh, divided up Africa, they divided it up into uh, little parcels, uh, often cutting natural uh, ecological areas, dividing uh, ethnic groups by artificial boundaries, leaving a legacy of great difficulty, making it hard for uh, populations even to reach uh, coasts. In many parts of Africa, the coastal physical environment is rather hostile. Uh, and uh, in East Africa, the uh, eastern coast tends to be very dry. So the trade winds come uh, up to the coast uh, from the east. Uh, they do not provide precipitation right on the coast, but as the highlands in the east coast carry those trade winds uh, into higher altitudes, uh, then the rain is distributed in the interior, what's called orographic rainfall, or rainfall that is uh, caused by the uplift of the mountains, in this case, the highlands of East Africa. This means that the high population densities in East Africa are not at the coast, but are in landlocked interior countries like Rwanda, for example, or Uganda, where there's much more rainfall than one would find in their port of Mombasa, Kenya, uh, which is in a, a much drier region. So the distance from the ports has to do with uh, history. Uh, it has to do with political boundaries. Uh, it has to do, some historians think, with the uh, long legacy of even slave trade, which uh, caused populations in their self-defense to move uh, more into the interior. It has to do with the fact of rainfall being more propitious and able to support food production, often away from the coast and in the interior of the continent. We know uh, that uh, in many, many other ways, the colonial legacy has played a very difficult role. Have a look at the map uh, of uh, European colonial rule in Africa as of 1914. The first thing you see is the entire continent, with the exception of, uh, of Ethiopia, uh, was colonized. Africa was divided among the European powers. And the story of how it was divided is a rather shocking story. Actually, Africa was one of the last continents to succumb to European imperial rule. That may seem strange because Africa was very poor throughout history, therefore very vulnerable as uh, exemplified by the slave trade. So why wasn't it colonized earlier? Europeans attempting to move to the interior of Africa in the earlier parts of the 19th century to colonize, succumbed to malaria and to other tropical diseases. The disease burden actually prevented Europe from colonizing Africa until the latter part of the 19th century. Then what happened? Well, you could perhaps uh, ascribe it to tonic water. Tonic water is water with quinine. But quinine is a natural preventative or curative to malaria. And when quinine was discovered and then mass produced by the British uh, and then by the other imperial powers, that enabled Europe to dominate Africa through military means. Uh, the Europeans were brutal vis-a-vis -vis the Africans, but strangely polite and diplomatic among themselves. They sat down at a conference table at the famous Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885 and said, gentlemen, because of course it was only gentlemen around the table, let's divide Africa in a very civilized way, civilized for us without any civility vis-a-vis -vis the Africans. And by 1914, you had a map of Africa that was divided in all of these uh, arbitrary political divisions. This has left a legacy of wrong borders, of high landlockedness, of European 
domination over many of Africa's natural resources so that the resource earnings have been extracted and end up in tax havens around the world rather than in the treasury coffers of Africa itself. The European powers did not provide education. Indeed, uh, there is a documentary record showing we don't want to educate the local population. That would be a political risk for us. And so when African governments achieved independence, often there were just a handful of people uh, with a high school, uh, much less uh, a university education. The infrastructure physically that the European powers left behind was also strangely deficient. Have a look at a comparison of the map of the Indian railway system built largely during the British colonial period in India with the map of Africa's railway system built largely during the period of colonial rule. In India, you see a full grid, and that was because a unified colonial power, Great Britain, uh, created a unified infrastructure, partly to extract India's natural resources, including its cotton, uh, as inputs to the cotton mills of England. In Africa, where the conditions were harsher and more difficult and the political divisions existed, the European colonial powers did not sit down together after the conference in Berlin and say, now let's construct a railway network. They each one constructed just a line from their port to the diamond mine or to the gold mine or to the plantation. And so the rail system in Africa is uh, not a full grid, but is just spurs that go to a few locations. And this has a much greater burden for Africa. When India had its agricultural revolution, the so-called Green Revolution of the 1960s, this railway line played a crucial role in bringing fertilizer into the interior and bringing grain from the interior to the national economy. But in Africa, the rail can't serve that purpose. It doesn't exist. It still has to be built, even in the 21st century. So the legacies of colonial rule in Africa have been very, very tough. This isn't an explanation of everything. My point again and again is don't take a single factor. You cannot blame it just on colonial rule. We've seen you can't blame it just on, quote, corruption, because in many parts of Africa, the uh, levels of corruption are comparable to far richer countries in other parts of the world. You can't blame it just on culture, though culture matters. It matters for gender. It matters for fertility. It matters for commitment to education. You can't blame it just on geography, but geography surely has played a role in the burden of disease, in the vulnerabilities of agriculture, in the high transport costs. A differential diagnosis doesn't necessarily give you a simple answer. Simple answers are often highly simplistic answers. We need accurate answers. And a differential diagnosis helps with accuracy. It identifies several of the challenges that need to be addressed, even though Africa and other countries still stuck in poverty may face added burdens they also have the opportunities for technological breakthroughs unimaginable until recently. Now when you go even to the remote African villages uh, across the continent, maybe with few exceptions, but as a general rule, your mobile phone coverage is there, broadband is on the way, information technology is already transforming uh, these very low income villages, very low income regions, bringing in knowledge, market information, data, empowerment, and the potential for breakthroughs in health, in education, in business development. In other words, when we make the differential diagnosis, we identify the political and the cultural and the geographic phenomena. When we identify the heritages of the colonial period and the shortfalls of infrastructure, we are not overcome by pessimism, 
but we are motivated with an agenda, an agenda which is targeted, specific, a balance of public and private investment, uh, areas for social mobilization, public awareness, a role of parents to help their children uh, to make breakthroughs as well. That is the key to sustainable development.